Hi everybody, Russ Barkley here with another commentary on ADHD. This is part three of my series on factors that one needs to consider in choosing the initial medication for the management of ADHD. In this case, part three, we're going to talk about the importance of comorbid disorders in medication selection. Now, when we think about the patient, we think also about what coexisting disorders are associated with ADHD in that patient, and what relevance does that have for choosing a medication? Well, in the case of children, there are rare children who have pre-existing serious growth issues. They may be significantly smaller than other children for a variety of reasons. In those cases, one might hesitate about prescribing a stimulant because it is known to have small but significant effects on growth, particularly in stature in these cases. And some research suggests that children who take stimulant medications may not grow as quickly as other children. Indeed, they may be about one to three centimeters shorter in their height or stature than children not taking medication after several years on the medication. Now, luckily, it appears that these growth problems are, diminish and indeed disappear. And by adulthood, there's no measurable effects of having taken stimulants on the growth that is the height and weight of the individual. But there might be some initial factors to consider. So in the case of children who are small in stature or height, the clinician might want to think about using a non-stimulant that isn't going to produce the anorexic or appetite suppression effects that we see with the stimulants, which can lead to growth problems. Even then, if the ADHD is severe and stimulants are likely to be the best choice for some children, then that is where one might use a stimulant but introduce drug holidays for that particular patient. We don't do drug holidays anymore for the vast majority of people. A drug holiday is where we stop the medication on weekends, take you off for the summer to give you a chance to eat and to grow in the case of kids. Uh, and that might be something to institute where the child is already small and where there seems to be significant problems with growth over time on the medication. In those cases, drug holidays might be indicated or try a non-stimulant medication. So important things to consider there, at least for kids. Now, also, does the patient already have problems with sleeping and specifically with insomnia? Why is that? Because the stimulants are more likely to create insomnia. Indeed, in about half of all patients, they report a worsening of their insomnia or the time to fall asleep than do patients off medication or these patients before they took medication. So think about that. Can you afford to worsen the insomnia that already exists? Uh, again, you might try the stimulant, see what happens. Otherwise, here's another instance where non-stimulants might be better choices for this patient. So let's remember that up to 40% of children and adults with ADHD have sleeping problems. In some cases, that's problems with insomnia or falling asleep. And those may be instances where the stimulants are not necessarily indicated. But I will tell you that in about 20 to 30% of patients with insomnia, they report that they fell asleep better when they were taking stimulants than when they didn't. So there can be this kind of a paradoxical effect on sleep onset within that subset of patients. So uh, it's not always a guarantee that the stimulants will worsen insomnia. But where that happens, think about one of the two non-stimulants, the norepinephrine drugs, or the use of the antihypertensive drugs like guanfacine or clonidine XR, or possibly the use of drugs like bupropion. So, uh, now another thing to think about is, excuse me, the presence, let's back that up a bit, of anxiety or other disorders. Now, the research is mixed as to whether stimulants worsen anxiety or not. So, it's arguable. Half of the studies suggest it might. Other studies, and indeed meta-analyses, don't seem to find that to be the case. I have found that it seems to be how you measure the anxiety. If you measure it dimensionally, degree of anxiety, 
then in some cases, stimulants might make the anxiety a little worse. If you measure it in terms of disorders of anxiety, well, we don't see those getting worse with the stimulants necessarily. But I tell you, the research is conflicting enough that I still advise clinicians and patients to be a little cautious. If you have a frank anxiety disorder, then maybe you don't want to be starting with a stimulant. Or if you do, monitor the anxiety more closely to see if the stimulant is making it worse. Now, ADHD creates a problem with emotion regulation. And as a result, there might be problems with minor aspects of managing anxiety that are purely the result of that aspect of ADHD. Believe it or not, those kinds of mild degrees of anxiety have been found to improve with ADHD medications, the stimulants included. And I think that's because it helps to manage the executive deficits that are linked to ADHD, one of which is emotion self-regulation, and that might minimize the little bit of anxiety that's related to having ADHD and all of the issues and complications and failure experiences that might be going along with the ADHD. But as the anxiety rises to the level of a clinical disorder, then we might want to think twice about a stimulant. But as I said, the point is arguable. Some people plow ahead and try the medication anyway. If you do, just monitor the anxiety more closely. And the same applies with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder or behavior. We know that stimulants can increase this kind of behavior, certainly in animals and to some extent, some clinical reports in people as well. So again, we might want to be a little cautious if the patient has ADHD with OCD because stimulants might not be so great for OCD. Non-stimulants might be better. We have seen that, for instance, non-stimulants like atomoxetine or the norepinephrine drugs may even treat social anxiety in adults with ADHD, maybe even in kids. Perhaps they're also beneficial for uh, OCD as well. We're just not sure about that. So just a reason to be a little more cautious in pre prescribing stimulants for OCD. Now, autism spectrum disorder. It used to be we never recommended stimulants if a child had autism for fear that it would worsen the symptoms that go along with autism and might even make the patient more prone to psychosis because after all, autism and schizophrenia are genetically linked to each other to some degree. We now know that you can use both stimulants and non-stimulants with patients on the autism spectrum, but there does appear to be a slightly lower degree of responding, that is percentage of responders, slightly lower degree of improvement from the medication, and maybe a slightly greater likelihood of having side effects to the stimulant medications. Again, all of these findings are not well established, perhaps a bit equivocal, yet for a clinician, something that they might want to think about. And if they use a stimulant, then as always, monitor the patient more closely for worsening of the comorbid disorder. And in the case where the patient already has ADHD with schizophrenia or with a psychosis, we would argue against using a stimulant because we already know that stimulants can be provocative of psychotic episodes in people with pre-existing psychosis. And even in about one to 2% of patients that don't have pre-existing schizophrenia, but may have a prior history of these thought disorders that could come out with taking a stimulant. So there is another instance where the non-stimulants might be a better choice for those patients. But now let me go back to the anxiety issue for a moment, because there's a little bit of research to suggest that patients that have clinical levels of an anxiety disorder may have worsening of their working memory from stimulants. There's only a couple of reports out there. Again, I don't want to say that that's definitive, but it is an issue worth exploring further, not only in research, but being aware of in clinical practice. So while stimulants may not worsen ADHD may not worsen anxiety in patients who have anxiety already. There's a possibility it could worsen their working memory to some extent. Just something to think about. Now, what about tics? Here, like with autism spectrum, it used to be that we told patients that we were not going to prescribe stimulants 
if they already had a tic disorder or full-blown Tourette's syndrome. But subsequent research with people with tics and Tourette's found that it didn't worsen tics in most people. Indeed, two-thirds of the patients reported no worsening of their tic disorders when stimulants were used for treating ADHD comorbid with a tic disorder. But about a third of them did report some exacerbation of their tic disorder. This was primarily in conjunction with treatment with amphetamine, much less likely with methylphenidate, and certainly not at all with the stimulant or the non-stimulant medications like atomoxetine or guanfacine or clonidine. And indeed, guanfacine and clonidine have been used to actually treat tic disorders in patients with tics. So those drugs might be alternatives to think about. But now what is recommended is if you want to try the stimulant, go ahead. But again, monitor the frequency of the tics more than you more closely than otherwise would be the case. If it worsens, stop the medication. If it's due to the medication, it should reverse back to baseline within a week. If it doesn't reverse back to baseline, then the worsening of the tics probably had nothing to do with the medication and would just be coincident with it. We do know that certain tic disorders worsen as they progress toward Tourette's overdevelopment, uh, and it could just be that happening here. So something to think about. Finally, believe it or not, there's a few studies that suggest that presence of a math disorder could cut the response to stimulants, in this case, methylphenidate, in half. It's only been studied in methylphenidate. We don't know about amphetamine or the other medications, but several studies done in Canada suggested that where there was a math disorder, the percentage of responders fell from about 75% to about half that, 37% in those comorbid cases. Why this would happen, we don't know. There may be a different kind of attention deficit linked to math disorders. Maybe it's more related to cognitive disengagement syndrome. We just don't know. Uh, but certainly something to think about when you're dealing with people with ADHD who have comorbid math problems. So there are some comorbid conditions to think about in deciding on what medication to start with when we are managing ADHD. All right, everybody, I hope you found this useful. And if you have, please recommend the channel to others. If you're not a subscriber, as always, I suggest that you subscribe. No pressure there, though. Uh, and once again, live well, be well, and take care. Thank you.